So I'm delighted to be with you again for this third and final uh, session. We're still searching for a faith that that, that can sustain uh, the deepest lungs of the human heart, as Karen said, for happiness, for meaning, for purpose. And today we're going to focus on the need for hope um, and the need for a faith that lends us hope. Hope for ourselves, hope for our families and friends, hope for our community, uh, hope for our world. You know, when you think about it, all the longings of the human heart need hope uh, to sustain them. Uh, in our Catholic faith, I would say we pay comparatively little attention to the virtue of hope. And when you think about it, I bet you've heard lots and lots of sermons about love and about faith. But I've seldom heard anything explicitly on hope. And yet all three need, e need each other. They can't function uh, alone. Faith leads to hope, which leads to love, which leads back to faith. Essentially. But we certainly need hope, we give it this day in the sun here, to keep on keeping on in the everyday of life. And especially, of course, we can be doing fine and then hit a bump in the road. Uh, and in times of difficulty, both personal and social. And then surely, you know, when you stop and look at the state of our of our world, of the cosmos, um, we immediately recognize that this, our time is a very challenging time for hope. Um, the threat of to our environment uh, from pollution and climate change that Pope Francis is constantly calling our attention to with great urgency and worry and Let's keep, try to keep hope alive for this environment of ours rather than just poisoning ourselves and the ozone layer over us all. Uh, there's the myriad violations of human rights and human dignity throughout the world. Uh, the exploding numbers of people uh, suffering from hunger, and food deprivation, and starvation. So, I mean, just the statistics coming out of somebody like some place like the Sudan are just staggering. From one location, the number of little kids were dying um, of hunger. It, it's uh, it, it's so heartbreaking uh, and and appear, almost hopeless when you stop and think about it. There's the many forms of discrimination throughout our societies based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, etc. Uh, the horrors of war and violent conflicts, some of them well-known, some of them just still ignored but dragging along and so on. Uh, the lack of a moral compass in the public realm, people claiming patent falsehoods to be alternative truths. And the list goes on how our, our public realm uh, can be so antithetical and, and uh, challenging to keep hope alive. And then on the personal level, all of us face challenges to our hope. Now we can be doing fine. Uh, there's the daily challenges that come with the turf of life. Um, getting out of bed and finding yourself in a bad cold, for example, you still have to keep hope alive. But then there can be major personal challenges to hope as well for ourselves, for our family, illness, tragedy, addiction. Uh, any any one of which could stretch our hope to breaking point. So how can we keep on as hopers, uh, both in the public realm and in our personal lives? What kind of faith, because that's the clue, what kind of faith might help to sustain us in hope? So that's really my focus for our conversation today. Uh, faith and love can't function without hope. And then conversely, faith and love nurture hope as well. That was Aquinas' great insight that these three great virtues are what he called perichoretic. In other words, they flow in and out of each other. Faith leads to hope, which leads to love, which leads back to faith. Um, also, I want to make a little side note, and then the literature makes this point, that, that hope is not just being optimistic. Uh, you know, at times, optimism can be, can be naive. It can be a refusal to face what should be faced. By contrast, real hope is very realistic and down to earth. It faces whatever needs to be faced. So rather than sugaring things over or playing nice or playing make-believe, that's not real hope. A key to real hope is that it hangs, uh, in spite of ev evidence of the contrary, um, that, that is that it hangs in. Like the real hope hangs in uh, with the struggles. And... Um, the, the conviction is the, the, the epistle of the Hebrews calls hope the conviction of things not seen. 
that we can't see. Now, a common phrase, and I'm going to ask you a question, a common phrase is hoping against hope. You've often heard people say, well, you have to hope against hope. And of course, it comes from St. Paul, uh, says letter to the Romans. And it's, it's interesting. I just want to have a little fun here. Uh, St. Paul is talking about the faith of Abraham, that Abraham was called to be the parent of a mighty of mighty nations. And here he was 100 years old at the time. And yet Abraham believed. And, and uh, Paul says he was hoping against hope that he could indeed uh, parent uh, many, many tri more tribes of nations. Uh, and that's, but now Genesis chapter 17 um, says that, that Abraham was told he was going to be the father of many nations, but so was Sarah. Now, Abraham, the text of seven, Genesis 17 says was Abraham was 100 years old, but Sarah was 90 years old. And by the way, I should say that Abraham being faced with parenting, this is long before Pfizer uh, in, in, uh, invented enhancements for the male libido, shall we say. But uh, it, in a sense, Abraham gets all the credit, whereas uh, Sarah believing that she too could parent, could mother children at that good age of 90. But anyway, both of them are deserve the accolade of hoping against hope. Um, and uh, in other words, even in the most difficult of times. Okay, let me bring you into the conversation. All right, let me invite you into a, a little reflection. I will do this quietly, but do take notes from yourself because you've got wonderful resources in your own faith. I bet you've got tremendous resource for hope. And it, it's why you would show up at a, at a, at a gig like this. Um, so reflect on your own hopes. What are some challenges, though, to your hope at this time? When you stop and think about it, what challenges rise up to greet you by way of your hope? Just recognize them. Maybe jot them down or jot a word for them. And a second question, how does your faith help to sustain your hope, especially in the day to day, not just when you're in church on Sunday or something, but how does your faith on a Monday help you to sustain hope. Because Aquinas was convinced that the key to hope is it that type of faith that can sustain it. So what kind of faith do you imagine is needed to keep hope alive? In your own life, what kind of faith do you need to keep hope alive? All right, well, hold on to your own good wisdom. I'll make a few suggestions, and then we'll give you back into your small groups for a good eight or 10 minutes of a good chat. And always use that time well. Don't, the, the expert here is no expert at all, really. Uh, I'm a fumbling, uh, groping person for hope myself. And um, so th there's no great expertise. And uh, the, the people beside you in your group uh, will have as much as I have. And, uh, and, you, and then your own expertise. Don't underrate that or underrate sharing it. Okay. Um, let me make a kind of the generic statement. For Christian faith, human the ultimate source of hope is the Paschal mystery. In other words, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, who we know to be the Christ of faith, the Son of God. And so that's really, and we'll come back to that later, that, that what he talked about is the reservoir of grace, the abundance of grace, that his Paschal mystery, as we face into Holy Week next week, uh, released into, into human history, this extraordinary resource of grace that will always be at high tide toward us, as we said in a previous session. Um, so we'll always have the grace we need, uh, even though at times it may look scarce uh, and you're perfectly entitled, as I'll say in a moment, to cry out and protest when you're not experiencing hope. And yet, 
the grace is there because of this Paschal mystery, this life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And of course, his whole public ministry uh, was, a, was a witness to radical hope, and especially for people most in need. And I, I spend a lot of time typically with the, with the uh, synoptic gospels, but let me give John a, a little moment in the sun here. Um, he, John, in John's gospel, he says, that I came that you may have life and have it to the full. Uh, that was his own statement of purpose. Talk about the promise of hope. Or he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there's no better way to live life than the way he modeled. He was the, he was incarnated the way, the truth, and the life. And to so live is a tremendous source of hope for us. The bread I give is my flesh for the life of the world. So again, he gave himself his own bread, his own body, uh, his own flesh for the life of the world. So tremendous hope. The synoptics, I often think the, the text in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, uh, it says Jesus, and this is, you can basically, Jesus went through Galilee spreading hope, uh, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the reign of God. That was the best hope we've ever had. That will always be the best hope we have, the coming of the reign of God, and that God's will might get done on earth as it is in heaven. And then uh, curing diseases of every sickness among the people, and, of course, feeding them and bringing them to the table and all the other. There were, it was all a wonderful life of hope. Uh, his whole public ministry was lending hope, hope for the poor. He told them, yours is the reign of God. I mean, talk about giving poor people hope. Um, I often, I'm reading um, Harriet Tubman, the life of Harriet Tubman at the moment. And it's just, it's just so ghastly, so terrible, uh, the, the, the dreadful racism that, uh, that defines uh, so much of our history as a people, as a country, uh, the dreadful racism. But, in the midst of horrendous slavery, Harriet Tubman and her family and her friends kept hope alive just by, by their faith. Uh, it was, it, and that's typical. That's, that's what Jesus would want, hope for the poor, because theirs is indeed the reign of God, and the rest of us better become more like them if we want to enter the reign of God. Hope for the sick, constantly curing diseases. Uh, of all kinds, uh, even on the Sabbath day, the, the breaking the Sabbath, seven or eight times he did it on the Sabbath just to give people hope, hope for the hungry, fed them by the thousands. And as you've heard me say this before, the only uh, the only miracle uh, other than the resurrection, the only miracle in the gospel six times is the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then twice in Matthew, twice in Mark. It was a central part of his public ministry, giving hope to hungry people. Um, hope for the marginalized. All were welcome to the table, the prostitutes, the sinners, the tax collectors. There was hope for them all, hope for women. Uh, they were among, among his core disciples. I'll come back to this at the end of our of our of our conversation. Um, but Luke eight says that they'd come up from Galilee with him. The whole group of women. If you take John's chronology, that means they were with him for three years, uh, and and holding out hope. Uh, you can imagine the hope that he was lending these these women in a world that was dreadful of dreadful chauvinism and and uh, male uh, dictatorship and what have you. Hope for sinners. And it's just by coincidence, today's gospel reading in the common lectionary is the story, it's, it's in John chapter eight of the woman caught committing adultery. And uh, it's a powerful text. I love that text. And and he says to them, whoever is without sin among you cast the first stone. And at least they had the integrity to walk away. Uh, they knew that they they were compromised themselves. And he turned to her and he says, woman, is there no one to condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. He said, then neither will I condemn you. Talk about offering hope for sinners. No, he did add, go your way and sin no more. He wasn't just a license to go continue continue her, her lifestyle or whatever was on. But 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 it was the lovely, gentle way he handled it, forgave her, took her sin seriously, and yet go your way and sin no more. Hope for children. Uh, he said they basically own the reign of God. It's theirs. It's it's they they they're in charge really of the reign of God. Um, tremendous hope. And then Jesus dying and rising, we believe, catalyzed into human history what Paul calls God's abundant grace. I think I've said that enough times in this three week, three time series. Um, but if you remember nothing else from this uh, series of reflections, remember that God's grace 
is always at high tide toward us. It's always at high tide. The Paschal mystery is God's effective love at work. And that's what lends us hope. No matter what suffering, no matter what evil we face, there's hope. Uh, and again, I pile on a few scripture quotes here. He says, "I." Paul begins his his uh, letter to the uh, to the Romans. I, Paul, am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Our Christ Jesus, our hope. He begins by naming Jesus our hope. He encourages to rejoice in hope, to endure in hope. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace, and abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, God gave us good hope through grace. We always have good hope through grace. By God's great mercy, this is Peter. First Peter, we now have a living hope uh, because of the resurrection of Jesus. We must always be ready, according to First Peter, to give an account of the hope that is in us. So uh, given your reasoning, for hope and being ready to give an account of your hope, especially to people who might need to hear that account. So in other words, we can always have hope by God's grace in Jesus Christ. Simple, but core truths of our faith. And yet then you have to say, pardon me, but as always, from a Catholic perspective, God's grace and our partnership is essential. Uh, even as grace sustains our efforts, in other words, that, that, that uh, Al-Anon, uh, conviction that we do it, people in recovery do it with the help of higher power, and yet it's a huge effort. In other words, th there's nothing easy about hope. Uh, we're still uh, to be in the struggle. Uh, now the grace will sustain our efforts, but nonetheless, is this is not naivete or Pollyannish at all. It's very real, very down to earth. Uh, we'll always need the help of higher power, but our own good efforts as well. Uh, the two together, it's one of the one of the most positive aspects of Catholic, the Catholic tradition, this emphasis on both. Because our good Protestant friends at the time of the Reformation said, it was grace alone, gratia sola, that we're saved by grace alone, or by faith alone. And, and Catholicism came back and said, no, it's not just faith alone, it's faith and good works. Uh, it's not just grace alone, it's grace and our own best efforts. It's the, and it's a, it's a hugely empowering aspect of our faith um, that really it is to be cherished and, and so on. Um, for Aquinas, faith comes before and sustains hope. So I'm going to give a quickie here. So what kind of faith then? So if, if that's the promise of God's grace and hope for our lives, what what's the what's the uh, what sustains? What kind of faith would keep that? Uh, would keep such hope alive. Uh, uh, because, and I'm going to propose that faith requires a live, or sorry, hope requires a living, a living faith. And I highlight that. Now, it includes, now it includes what we believe. But you see, so often the old legacy of the old catechism is we put, as, as Catholics, we put so much emphasis on belief and having the light, right belief, belief, belief. And of course, there's a belief aspect to our faith, of course. And we have great dogmas and doctrines and sacraments and symbols and scriptures and so on and so on to be believed. Um, and yet, if we just think of faith as belief, it may never get us to hope. It may never get us to hope. I think faith is broader than belief. I think we need a living faith to sustain hope. What do I mean by living faith? By living faith, I mean a faith that is a, there's a threefold emphasis I want to raise up. A faith that is alive, lived, and life-giving. Alive, lived, and life-giving. Let me spend a moment on each. A faith that's alive, that's ever deepening, maturing, growing. Uh, I always love his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, where he said that his gospel would be like a, 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 a gushing up, a well of water gushing up uh, to eternal life. Uh, Frank uh, or uh, uh, Dan Harrington, one of our great colleagues, gone home to God, a wonderful scripture scholar. He said the best translation of that text is that the water is to be gushing up <laughs> to eternal life. So there's always, in other words, our faith should always be fresh water. Uh, stagnant, stagnant water it kills, it, it poisons. And we can't allow our faith to get to become stagnant. Not if you take a course like this, of course, you won't. Uh, but uh, uh, it has to remain fresh. 
and, and keeping it fresh is part of our responsibility. Uh, when faith falters, hope does as well. So we must keep it, we must keep it alive, our faith, and expanding and growing rather than the same old, same old routine. Then our faith, the faith that keeps hope alive needs to be a lived faith. Uh, in other words, Christian faith has to get done. Uh, it has to be put to work in the ordinary and the everyday of life, doing God's will on earth as it's done in heaven. But Jesus says in Matthew 7, not, it's not the one who says, Lord, Lord, who enters the reign of God, but the one who does the will of my Father. In other words, you can talk all your life and say, Lord, 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 but you've got to do. It has to be lived. Uh, it has to be lived. And and Jesus to the lawyer, to the lawyer, to the good Samaritan story, uh, when the law, when he asked the, the, the lawyer, so who who was the neighbor? The lawyer says, I suppose the one who, who helped him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Uh, and of course, it's how we will be judged at the end of the day. And, and it'll be fascinating because geez, God will not say to us, there was a hungry person one time and you fed them. Or there was a stranger one time you took them in. But God will say, I was hungry. He gave me to eat. I was thirsty. He gave me to drink. Uh, so this faith of ours has to be lived. <laughs> we don't live it. Well, I don't want to coin a phrase, but there could be hell to pay, uh, as it were. And then, of course, our faith should be life-giving. should be a tremendous source of life-giving, giving this for ourselves, for others, and for the world. And, and that, that life-giving faith is, as expresses itself uh, toward hope, especially with acts of compassion and justice. Uh, then I'm winding out of my, my presentation a few more minutes. What are the very heavy crosses? Uh, personal, social, um, or the terrifying disasters, uh, sometimes caused by nature, sometimes caused by human sinfulness. I mean, there are some tremendously um, challenging uh, issues to our personal hope and to our hope as a people. Um, I think the most helpful thing that Jesus said, and I learned this from the great Gustavo Gutierrez, a great uh, Latin American liberation theologian. Gutierrez did enormous, a, a, a tremendous commentary on Jesus saying to the to the people, uh, "Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy." Am I burdened light? Now, my attitude toward that for many years was to say, "Yeah, right. Uh, how about some of the some of the, you know, the the burdens I'm carrying? Uh, they don't feel light to me." But Gustavo had this insight that in the world of the time, the yoke—it was a farm implement—was always double. There was never a single yoke. In other words, you'd have two beasts of burden. Uh, horses or two horses or whatever in the in the uh, there was always two in the yoke uh it was never a single uh so when jesus says take my yoke upon me upon you and learn from me jesus is really saying hey i will pull my side of the yoke and you'll have to pull yours but i will be pulling along with you you'll never be by yourself uh dragging that yoke i'll be with you because his yoke was a double. It was always a double in the world of the time. It's just a lovely way of thinking about, even in difficult, difficult times, that Jesus is pulling with us, as it were. Uh, always a double. Uh, in other words, Jesus promises to be ever pulling the plow alongside of us, no matter how heavy. Uh, in our most challenging and burdened times, we often cry out to God in protest, and we're entitled you don't have to be nice to God. God can handle it uh, if you're mad as a hatter. Jesus hanging on the cross was mocked by the priests and the elders who said, hey, he saved others and he couldn't save himself. I often think it's the most intense statement of his full humanity and his solidarity with us because it's true of us all. We could all help to save others, but we cannot really save ourselves by ourselves. Can't be done. Um, but it was an extraordinary statement of his humanity. He saved others. He couldn't save himself. Um, 
And we can be fully honest with God. Uh, we don't have to be sugar it over. Uh, he cried out from the cross. And I don't think he was just quoting Psalm 22 or whatever it was that some of the scholars say. Uh, I think he shouted from the heart, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Uh, powerful statement by Jesus from the cross. And yet he still believes in this God. Uh, so when we struggle for hope, you don't need to act, act nice to God. God will handle it. Uh, let me bring you into a little reflection time and, and uh, we're going to give you plenty of time. And then I want to come back and offer a reflection on Holy Saturday and how it's such a powerful symbol of hope. What is your best wisdom? Now, stop and think about that. I'm going to give you a good minute at least to think about this. What is your best wisdom or decision that's beginning to emerge from my rambled reflections here today on the challenge of hope? What are you coming to see for yourself about hope? What are you convinced of about hope? the virtue of it, the challenge of it. Second question, is there a particular cross that you're carrying at this time and how might you imagine Jesus pulling the plow with you? Uh, now, remember our whole sacramental principle. Jesus will help pull the plow, but through the ordinary and every day. So sharing your burden with a friend, uh, reaching out to somebody for, to give you some, some hope, especially when you're, when you're short in short supply yourself. Um, so it's not as if Jesus will appear beside you in a little plow. Um, but but the friends you have, the, the community you have, the family you have, the good insights, the good faith you have. Um, yeah, that, that'll all, they need to draw upon it all. Uh, so that's, so my question, when you stop and think about it, how is Jesus pulling for you at this time? Especially with an issue that challenges your hope. I'm going to do a little bit of a reflection, brief two minutes, on Holy Saturday. Be inspired by those women who are with him from Galilee. Uh, because I often think we terribly underrate Holy Saturday. Like, we take Good Friday, Jesus crucified, and then we have a nice liturgy on Saturday, and, um, and then Easter, Easter. And of course, uh, yeah, definitely Easter will come. Are we ready for Sunday? Uh, we skip over, in many ways, we skip over Saturday. But in a sense, there is a whole spirituality um, uh, that we find ourselves, it doesn't come that quickly. Holy Saturday can drag on. Uh, and uh, and as if Jesus is not yet resurrected, as if Jesus hasn't risen yet, at least in, in our own faith, sure, for the faith of the church and the faith of other people. But I often meet people who who have a tough time just moving on immediate, immediately uh, to Easter. Uh, and I encourage us to remember the women disciples who accompanied Jesus. Uh, they were at the foot of the cross. Now, all four Gospels have them there. They're at the foot of the cross when the men had all run away. Uh, they accompanied Jesus to the foot of the cross. They saw him die, this most horrendous death, the worst form, the most cruel form of execution ever imagined in the history of humankind, crucifixion. Um, and they witnessed it, and they stayed there at the foot of the cross when the men had all run away. Now, what... Talk about hoping against hope and, and watching him die this horrendous death. Uh, and uh, just, and that then they would turn around, uh, that they would turn around. They never lost hope, which is so extraordinary. Uh, and instead, Mary Magdalene and the other women disciples, uh, it says they went to the tomb uh, the next morning, on, on the Sabbath morning, 
to anoint the body. They still wanted to take and cherish and hope and dignify and and uh, perform this traditional anointing that would have been postponed because they, they didn't want to break the Sabbath. Um, but they were hoping against hope, these women. Uh, there are varied names for them. They include Mary Magdalene. Oh, she's in all four Gospels puts Mary Magdalene there. Um, but then other Marys. There's a Mary, the, 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 the mother of James, there's Salome, there's Joanna. Then it, there's a generic that just, say, that just says, that, and other women. So there's a whole group of women. And they had come up from Galilee with him, which, as I said, is John. If John's chronology is right, then they were with him for three years. Uh, and here they are hanging into the bitter end. And I think they can be a wonderful inspiration for us. Sometimes we have to stay with Holy Saturday. Uh, rather than rushing forward to resurrection, we have to wait and wait and wait, and yet to wait with hope. Uh, and it, I often think it was because of her tremendous faith that Jesus, the risen, the, now the risen Christ, uh, gave Mary Magdalene the great, great favor. Of course, she also was at the tomb. Uh, and it says in John chapter 16, or Mark chapter 16, that he appeared first uh, to Mary Magdalene. Um, and I often think it was a reward for her living faith that uh, he gave her that special favor. And, and then, of course, she becomes then what the apostola apostolorum, the apostle to the apostles. That was always her, her, uh, her title, coming down with over seven or 800 years the first seven or eight hundred years, and then sometime around the eighth century, we began to they say, no, she was Mary Magdalene. She was the she was the she was the the prostitute. No evidence of that whatsoever in the text, but we portrayed her as a prostitute. Uh, uh, there's nothing in the text. We made it up. We made it up. Um, but she was rewarded in the end for her living faith. So she's a great patron for us of how to hang in, how to stay with. Holy Saturday, uh, but we have to, and when we can't just rush forward to Easter Sunday. It is a magnificent faith and witness there by those women, and especially by Mary Magdalene. I'll leave you with that good thought. Mm -hmm.